So let's begin with the pediatric eye exam and some tips. Now, in medicine, you guys have heard of universal precautions. It's important to be properly equipped for any procedure. Uh, sterile technique needs to be sterile. Now with kids, we have to do a couple of extra things. And one of those things is you have to protect yourself. Now that is a welding um, apron. It's kick proof uh, in the lower regions. Some welding gloves, and of course children can spit. And so we have to put on our proper apparel. Now I tried to get a child uh, from one of our employees, um, despite my attempt to institute the uh, Tomoka Tots program, was not able to do so. And so I had to uh, uh, bring in a, um, well, you'll see, basically a stump baby. So this is going to be our child for all of these exam techniques, and let's see how this works out. Now, one of the, <laughs> one of the problems, of course, with children is that it's not the same as the adult exam. Even something as simple as checking vision in a child can be very challenging. We just can't use the, the same techniques. Hmm. Anyway, moving on. In the adult, it's very obvious how we check vision. We start off with um, you know, the basic Snell and Acuity. Basically, if they're 2020, 2400, et cetera, et cetera. And if that doesn't work, we go to the what? The count fingers. And if they can't see even that well, we start talking about hand motion. Can they see your hand moving? And if they can't even see that well, we're talking, can they see light perception or not? And of course, there are some um, other levels. Projection, can they see where your hand is moving, up and down, left and right, or is the light coming from above, below? This gives us a little, little bit better sense. Now, with children, it's, it's quite a bit different. Uh, with kids, it's not so much how well they can see, it's how well they can communicate. Um, so you may start with snail and acuity, be it letters, numbers, animals. Uh, then you go on to fix and follow, and finally, blink to light, um, whether they blink to light. So I'm not going to tell you how to do a snell and acuity in a child. You're probably better at it than I am. But I will show you this. I think it's very interesting. This is the, um, the child uh, near card. And it always amuses me when I see these things because it's so antiquated. <laughs> like, what exactly is that telephone there? A child has never seen a rotary telephone, have they? And I think that must be some Vietnam-era Jeep as a car. <laughs> And yet no child has ever seen that before. And so, and of course there's the horse and a lot of kids haven't seen that either. So anyway, moving on. Fix and follow, we all know how to do that. Basically you grab an object in your clinic, you move it around, try to do one eye at a time and see if they can look at the thing. Now a eye drop bottle is pretty boring. So cell phones are always good, but don't let the child grab your phone because they will, as you mothers uh, know more than anyone. Now kids are quick, they're fast, they pick up things, they look at things very fast. But the problem with kids is they also get very bored very quickly, easily distractible. And so the key in the office is to have as many <laughs> objects that you can show these kids at a time. Because there's a rule, and that rule is the one object, one look rule. You show an object, they'll look at it, and they'll do it for one second, and then they'll become distracted and look at something else. And so anyway, if this video seems silly, I did it all in one take, so <laughs> bear with me. But the key is to have as many things as possible. Now, I don't have kids, so I had to go to Babies R Us and pick out as many things that looked <laughs> distracting to me as possible. <laughs> That's more for her. OK. It's Halloween. If a kid won't look at this, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> and finally, all children like power tools, and they especially like fire. <laughs> So, <laughs> propane torch, it's hot, don't touch. And when we're looking at kids, we're not even looking so much for how well they can see when they fix and follow, we're looking for symmetry. And if you have a child and you cover one eye and they do fine, but you cover another eye and they freak out, maybe it's because they've got one eye working. Maybe by covering their only seeing eye, they're reacting to this. And so this child might have some type of visual problem, amblyopia. Symmetry is what we're looking for. The Snellen chart, if I got a six-year-old who can't see better in 2040, I'm not worried as long as both eyes are seeing about the same. It's when one eye sees much better than the other, that's when we worry with children. Now, retinoscopy is, of course, the technique we use to figure out what their prescription is. We use this in uh, children, preverbal uh, pre children and adults who can't read back to us. And as you know, the idea is that you hold a light up, shine it into the eyes, look at the red reflex, and hold up different lenses in order to, um, to figure out the right prescription. Now, we're going to go over that more in the following lecture. With children, I always use a loose lens. Now, we have retinoscopy bars that have all these lenses in it, but kids will grab that thing, so you just can't use it. You have to use the loose lenses. It's almost invisible, the clear ones, so they don't know what you're doing, um, and it's much less distracting. 
Now, when checking pupils, kids are always scared of the light because it doesn't look like a flashlight. So what I like to do is shine it in my own eyes, shine it in their parents, hold it up to their fingers. That makes their finger glow red. They seem to really like that. <laughs> then, only then do I shine it into their eyes and check for their pupillary response. So eh, a little tip, a little trick. Now, when you're checking pressure in a kid, tono pin is obviously not going to work. And usually the best we can do is seeing if they're soft to palpation. Now, if a child lets you do this with their eyes open, there may be something else wrong. <laughs> and the whole idea here is, you know, you can only get so much pressure in a child. And so what we do is we look for, sorry, that's how I put dilating drops in, by the way. Um, no, I'm kidding. If you see a kid and you're thinking glaucoma, well, you have to start thinking, what, what could manifest as glaucoma? Because you're obviously not going to take every child to the operating room and do an exam under anesthesia. And so there are certain signs that we look for. Now, one of them is tearing, but as you can see, it's so nonspecific, all babies seem to cry. Another one, of course, is cloudy cornea. So if the pressure is high in the eye, that pressure will push water into the cornea and cause a steamy cornea. Now, if you see a kid that has a very large eye, such as this eye right here, um, while the kid may look beautiful, big giant eyes, this may be a scary sign because if a kid has a very large eyes, they may have congenital glaucoma. High pressure inside the eye over time um, stretches the eye. Kids have very elastic scleral walls and they can really expand, especially the cornea. So if you see a giant cornea in a child, you have to start thinking, maybe that's congenital glaucoma. Parents may love it, their kid looks gorgeous, but they've got a problem. This is a picture, the one on the left is a child with congenital glaucoma with some cupping. Not bad, but some cupping there. Uh, the picture on the right is the same child a couple years later after successful treatment for glaucoma. Now it's kind of interesting because here you can see that the cup to disc ratio has actually improved over time. This is the one case where a cup to disc might improve, which is pretty neat. And the reason why is because kids have very elastic eyes. As the pressure goes down, this is one of the cases where things shrink again and it can actually make the cup to disc a little bit better. The damage is still there. Nerves die, nerves die, but it looks better with time. Now, when checking confrontational fields, kids will cheat like anything. And so what I do is I hold two hands up, and I, they don't know which one to look for, and I'll switch fingers. That's for the older kids. A younger kid, you may have to distract them with an object, and then while they're looking at that object, bring in another object to the side and see if they notice it coming out of the side. So confrontational fields, the best you can do. One thing that's very useful when looking at kids, eye movements in general, is stickers. Because you can stick a sticker on your nose, it frees up your hand. Child's not used to that, they look at the sticker, and you can check for tropias, phorias, eye muscle stuff, and moving on. If you're gonna use stickers though, you need to know your modern cartoon characters. Which one was that? We all know these? Okay, and that last one? Dora. Dora. What's this one? I think it's Boots. Is Boots the name? Yeah. From the barrio, that's right, a Sesame Street. And our, uh, exactly, exactly. You got to know these things if you're going to talk to children. One nice thing about stickers is it has an exfoliating effect on the nose. It really clears the pores. And you can also attach them to children, but preferably not the same sticker. Moms get a little nervous about that. Now, I think here what I'm going to do is check for eye alignment. And this is a test called the Hirschberg test. And the idea is the corneal light reflex test. You're looking at how the corneal uh, reflex, the light bouncing off the surface of the eye looks in relationship to the pupil underneath. And as you can see here, that light reflex is a little medial. It's a little bit towards the inside. This doll is exotropic. The eyes are a little wall-eyed. So it's the Hirschberg. And there's a rule for every millimeter off of the pupil that light reflection is, uh, translates into approximately 15 diopters of atropia. It's just a general guideline, but if you have a kid, it's often hard to do a cross-cover test, and that may be the only way you can do it. This is called a Krimsky test. It's sort of the opposite. Basically, you hold a prism in front to neutralize or fix that pupil reflex. Yeah, it's moving over to more normal position. And basically, you hold up different uh, prisms until you get it back to normal, and you figure it out that way. I don't use the Krimsky that often because most kids don't like having things in front of their eye, and they won't sit still. But it's very useful. But in general, with children, I always use loose prisms. There are prism bars, and some people just love these, especially the adult strabismus doctors, but I find them so difficult to use, I pretty much use loose lenses for adults and children. I just, it doesn't slow me down that much. Um, checking a kid at the slit lamp can be challenging. Um, if they're too small, you just can't do it. If they're old enough, you can get them on the thing, go for it. One nice thing about kids is that if they have a problem, they usually only have one thing wrong with them. It's very rare to have multiple problems in children. Adults, we have multi-system issues, but with kids, usually one thing at a time, so get a fast look as best you can. If the kid's too young, you may not be able to use the slit lamp. 
If they're young enough, you may be able to put an eyelid speculum in, which is a little torture device. Um, but you know what? It's better to see this eye, make sure the kid's not going blind, and put them through some discomfort. And um, this usually upsets mothers more than anyone. And then fathers are completely useless when it comes to holding the child, so just remember that. Um, the final point I'll make as far as the kid exam is that when you look at the retina, if you can get the child to fall asleep, sneak in, turn your light beam as low as you can. If you might have to turn the room lights completely low, the less light going to that eye, the less the child will be annoyed. Very, very gently open that eyelid and try to sneak in there. Because if you can't do it asleep, you're gonna have to put that lid speculum in and it's a big pain in the butt for everyone. So, I hope you found this useful. Some basic pediatric tips and I appreciate your time. And let's take a little break. Uh, what time is it? It's about 8.20. We're gonna take a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to learn how to do retinoscopy. Thank you.